a general goes to war. The general, Joseph Mobutu, commander of the Congolese army, here leaving Leopoldville, capital of the Congo, to see his troops in action. His destination, Kikwit, chief town in Kwilu province. For it's here that the Congo is once again being torn by civil war. This time, a revolt against the central government by left-wing rebels supported by communist China. In the bush of Kwilu province, local tribesmen are supporting 15,000 guerrilla troops. On his way to the war zone, General Mobutu, back on duty after a month's leave, discusses the situation with a Belgian military advisor. The seriousness of the Kwilu revolt has only just been admitted by the Congolese government. Until three weeks ago, they played it down. Now they see it as a bid to set a pro-communist regime in the Congo, in the heart of Africa. But Mobutu's men in Kwilu face a hard task. There's only 1,500 of them to hunt for guerrillas in an area half as big as Belgium. Mobutu will find it hard to spare many more men. His total army strength of 30,000 is already fully stretched, keeping the peace in a country nearly the size of Western Europe. Another problem. From the end of June, Mobutu won't be able to call on help from the United Nations force. Its 5,000 men are finally being withdrawn. But even in the interval, Mobutu is unlikely to ask the UN to intervene actively. He wants to prove that the Congolese army can win its own battles. But if it can't, the Congo's future will indeed be grim. The Quilu rebels are virtually a bow and arrow army, but they're well organized. Their leader, Pierre Mulele, was trained in guerrilla warfare in communist China. His revolt may well be a major move in Peking's drive to gain Africa for Chinese-style communism. Mulele's men call themselves the Jeunesse, it means youth. These are some of the 300 rebels being held captive in Kikwit town. Their communism is primitive enough. They say it will give them everything the white man has. The few rifles they possess are crudely made. They mostly use bows and arrows. On his visit to Kikwit, General Mobutu tested a rebel bow and arrow. A poisoned arrow killed his own chief of staff four weeks ago. We begin today with the Belgo-Congolese Roundtable Conference in 1960. While there was the conference itself was held with the main leaders of the Congolese liberation movement, including Joseph Kasabubu, Patrice Lumumba was not present. Resolution 14 of the conference adopted decided that there would be a second conference, one that's far less known about than the very famous Roundtable Conference that led to independence. This resolution adopted indicated that there would be a separate economic roundtable held in May of 1960, where Moise Shambe exclusively represented the Congolese actors, and on the other side of the table was the Committee Special du, Congo, du Katanga and the main actors of the Union Minier. On June 24th of 1960, these actors together signed a convention in which the assets of the company du Katanga, the main mining corporation in the Congo, were unilaterally given back to the Union Minier, and the company du Katanga would receive an indemnification of 1 billion Belgian francs. This was ratified by decree of the Belgian government without any provision for the division of these assets uh, to the independent Congolese government. This would set the stage in the 1960s for the discussion around what to do with the future of the corporation, which we'll be discussing at length today. One of the most powerful mining companies, possibly companies ever, that at one point would control 70% of the entire mining industry of the Congo, acted virtually as a parastate entity with its own military 
supported secessions, assassinations, murders, in general, bad acting, and in the process earned forty billion, it's roughly estimated in value from its extraction in mining in the Congo. That corporation is the Union Minier du Haut Katanga, the main mining company in the Congo. And it's where we're beginning our episode today, discussing how this corporation came to be, how it shifted its forms with the independence of the Congo, and how still to this day, the mining industry controls so much of the resources and extraction of the Congo. So some of the history of this entity begins in the early colonization period of the Congo with King Leopold II. In 1891, King Leopold chartered the company, forming the Compagnie du Katanga to organize activities in, in the Katanga region where the majority of the mining occurred. In 1990, the Congo Free State and the Compagnie du Katanga formed the Comité Special du Katanga and gave two-thirds of the assets to the Congo Free State, which was the personal property of King Leopold II, and one-third of the assets to the Katanga province, which began a regional split and division that would constantly invest Katanga with more resources, more development than the other regions of the Congo, as would play out in the 1960s. Of course, this entity wasn't just owned by Belgian capital, represented by the Société Générale du Belge, which was the main bank of Belgium. It also had significant investment by Tanganyika Concessions Limited, which represented British capital. And this bank, which was at the center of Belgian and colonial economy, would provide the majority uh, the Societe Generale, by the start of World War II, would control 70% of the Congolese economy. And during its heyday, the Union Miniere would hold quasi-governmental power in Katanga. It operated schools, dispensaries, hospitals, sporting establishments. It enjoyed virtually unlimited funds from Belgian banks. Belgian profits from the Union Miniere were in excess of 3.5 billion Belgian francs. Uh, and export duties paid to the Congolese government constituted 50% of the government's revenue. So this was a massively powerful corporation. Some statistics on the minerals produced. The, U the Union Minier had annual sales of 200 million US dollars. It produced 60% of the, of the uranium in the West, which we'll continue to talk about uranium as it's an interesting anecdote. 73% of all cobalt in the world, 10% of the world's copper, and it had 24 affiliates, including hydroelectric plants, chemical factories, and railways. So there were estimates by the 1960s that this portfolio controlled by the Union Minier represented anywhere of 35 to 40 billion Belgian francs. But as we'll discuss, the process of negotiating these assets and finding a nationalization process in the end would not be able to retain this this value or receive these assets to the Congolese government. The Union Minier was very successful in arranging its um, its assets to be taken out of the Congo. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting about the uh, history of the Union Minier. And I just wanted to add um, that often the colonization of Congo is conceived as being uh, exclusively this Belgian project. And we, I think we talked about a little bit, a little bit about this in the last, in the last um, episode, but in fact, it was always a, uh, um, like a multinational enterprise, really, that the uh, various countries of uh, Western Europe and also the US, they were always uh, active in this whole process. Uh, one really interesting thing is that, I mean, if, if I recall, correctly, uh, is that the USA was actually the first country to recognize the Congo Free State. So, correct me if I'm wrong, Joseph. Is, is, is no, that, I, is that I think that's right, yeah. So I remember reading that in, uh, in the thing, maybe the Poto book, um, and that it's really important to... Uh, so the way that it's conceived by the liberal, uh, liberal literature and so on is that uh, Belgian Congo was, first of all, uniquely evil among the different colonial um, 
uh, project. And secondly, that it was evil because of because of the Belgians in particular. Uh, and I'm I'm obviously not denying that uh, extremely awful things happen in Belgium and that the Bel uh, in Congo and the Belgians were responsible. But the fact is is that the this was a joint venture of the different Western uh, colonial powers and. Um, I can get up some more statistics that I have about the different, but you already mentioned about the different uh, ownership shares of the different Western European and American or the USA in uh, the Union Mini at, at the very beginning. But um, it's important to conceptualize this as really they, uh, I think I, I remember reading this in, I believe, the Podo book, uh, but different books also write about this is that, in fact, there was this kind of desire uh, on, this, on the behalf of uh, the Americans, uh, maybe the British as well, um, particularly the Americans, I understand, uh, to let the Belgians take Congo, because since the Belgians were quite weak comparatively, it'd be possible to share the Congo you know, between the different colonial powers. And there was less likelihood of the Congo's resources being monopolized if the Belgians took it, because the Belgians just wouldn't be able to really monopolize it in the way that maybe you know, France or something would, uh, could. And since the Congo is this huge area of, uh, with, you know, I mean, the, but it was it's a huge area. I mean, the, the mineral resources weren't so well known back then, but they still had an idea of some, at least, of some different uh, resource resources that could be extracted from there. But uh, if this huge area, this kind of power vacuum could be occupied by Weak, weaker power that could be more easily controlled. It'd be, it'd be more possible to take control, to use these resources as well and to share them out to prevent, uh, I suppose, some kind of excessive conflicts between the different colonial powers. So anyway, that's just a really important thing that I think, and you can really see that with the uh, the different ownership shares. I mean, this was the SGB, which is the one of the different iterations, basically, of the Union Union Minia, as I understand, right? Right, Joseph. And uh, this is the statistics for uh, the um, uh, very beginning of the 20th century, so like 1905 or so. And Belgian financial groups representing King Leopold, they only controlled uh, about half of the shares, and the rest were owned by British banks. Um, and then also uh, American, different financial groups, they were very, very involved. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and, and before as well. Uh, so yeah, there, there's plenty of statistics, but safe to say essentially that um, it was never just a Belgian affair. It was it was already, it was always heavy involvement by different Western powers. Yeah, definitely agreed on the point of the economic backing that was present by multiple Western companies. So you have Tanganyika concessions, for example, a British-owned asset that's mining in uh, South. Southeastern Africa is 40% of the ownership of what ultimately becomes the conglomerate of the Union Minier, which is mining in the Katanga region. In addition, this, uh, I wanted to add as well that this corporation would become this, some of the, the statistics on, uh, it's the height of its power, but at, at a certain point, the company became the world's third largest producer of copper, the largest producer of cobalt and radium, and one of the world's most important producers of germanium. And some of these resources may not, I think people will be familiar perhaps with uranium, but people may not necessarily understand why these resources are so important for the union to control and why they're making so much profit off of extracting cobalt. Today, we know perhaps the cobalt is, is very important for our phones and uh, other electronic devices that we use. But at this time, I think it's especially interesting to note some of the role, some of the uh, uses of, of these uh, alloys that were being extracted. So for example, all of them are being used to some extent in electrical equipment, strategic material alloys, metallurgical industry, of course, with uranium nuclear material, which we'll touch on. Uh, electroplating. So all of these things that especially are useful when you're conducting war and that will be very useful to the allied war effort, uh, for example, with uranium. And I just, I just, I just wanted to add as well that the, um, uh, as I understand, 
the uh, cobalt was used in particular for the production of different uh, engines, um, mm. in particular um, for aeroplane engines, different aeronautic um, applications. So um, it was uh, extremely important uh, in, in the military sense, but also in general uh, for general economic, economic development. Um, and you can really see the sense in which um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this some more soon, but um, in terms of the whole unequal exchange framework, which we're using, it's that uh, once you can get uh, cheapened uh, raw materials, then it becomes much easier to uh, bear the cost of uh, producing these processed, uh, more complicated goods, which you use with these raw materials. And uh, securing access to cheapened raw materials is really crucial um, when it comes to yeah, securing these uh, high-tech sectors that the high-wage high countries depend on to keep their wages high. Uh, which is that's something we've, we've the, the whole theoretical framework of which we've elaborated in our first episode of this series. Uh, so we won't go over too much. But suffice to say, uh, it's very important to have access to these cheapened materials that would be much more expensive if they were produced in a country without you know, slave labor, for instance, that Joseph was just talking about, um, which existed in the colonial um, period of, of Congo and where the wages, of course, were you know, many, many orders of magnitude lower than wages in um, any mine in the first world. Um, yeah, so uranium is uh, definitely one of the um, most important mineral exports that the Belgian colonial administration uh, exported from, from Congo uh, in terms of the world economy and uh, in terms of also Western military supremacy in particular. Um, and the first mine, the first uranium mine was opened in the Belgian Congo in 1921. Um, and by 1926, the um, um, Belgian basically mineral um, mon monopoly company in the Congo uh, had a, essentially a monopoly on the global uranium market. Um, and uh, I mean, just as an, as an example of how important this was, 80% of the uranium used in the Manhattan Project for the uh, creation of the first nuclear bomb came from the uh, deposits in Belgian Congo. Um, and this was in particularly a, a worry during World War II over control of the Congo uh, apparently Einstein even uh, wrote a letter to the Belgians wanting them not to uh, give control of uh, the, the Congo to the Nazis in order to uh, avoid control of this really incredibly strategic uh, mineral during the during wartime. Yeah, just some very interesting um, information in terms of the fact that the so you have this shady character Edgar Sangier who is the director of Union Minier. And he had stockpiled 1,000 tons of uranium in a warehouse on Staten Island in New York. Um, no idea why he did that. But of course, it shows more than anything the very close relationship between Union Minier as a very nefarious actor with the American, with American imperialism, with American industry. So you have this character, Colonel Ken Nichols, who, uh, this is a bit of a segue, but for those, I think it's interesting we're talking about this because of the recent, we were commenting on this separately, but you have the release of this movie Oppenheimer, which very much glorifies the process of building the, the Manhattan Project and the nuclear bomb. But in, in this is the reality of how this process was uh, achieved was you have this colonel who worked on the Manhattan Project who goes in and purchases this ore that's been refined and stockpiled. And one of the things that... So this is, I think, will help us comment as we go throughout in this episode to talk about how the Congo in the the big picture is that the Congo is shifting uh, the hegemonic imperialist control from Belgium to the United States over time. You can see that in the ownership of Union Minier and the mining in the Congo itself. You can see that in even this uranium dealing that the U.S. is beginning to realize just how important the uranium access is. Uh, so... This was shipped uh, by a commercial arm of Union Minier, the African Metal Corps. And then uh, the shipments just would continue throughout after 1942 
Um, but in the process, the U.S. also sent in uh, the Army Corps of Engineers to help actually make the mining facility run in Katanga. So you have the U.S. Army present on the ground helping to ensure that this uranium is being mined. In addition, you have the you have the Office of Strategic Services, which is the precursor to the CIA, uh, which is the U.S. foreign uh, intelligence apparatus during World War II. It's used primarily. And they are present on the ground as well, helping to ensure that the mining is successful and also that none of the... They, they want to ensure that Belgium, which is occupied by the Nazis at this time and has a shipment of uranium that, that has been sent to Brussels that was captured by the Nazis, they want to ensure that no shipments that are going out of the Congo are sent that as they're sailing westwards to the United States that are none of them are seized by the Germans. And this of course helps to build the the atomic bomb. As we know, the brutal uh and and genocidal dropping of the atomic bomb, um, which was which was made more than anything to demonstrate American hegemony and power and killed hundreds of thousands of, of civilians in Japan. But even you know going forward beyond that single event what the us wanted to do by working with the worst belgian colonialists in the congo was to ensure that this would be a base maintained secured for western imperialism and not for the soviets so after immediately after world war ii ends the us turns their attention to making sure that this is strategically seized and not possibly falling in the Soviet hands. They continue in 1947 to receive 1,400 tons of uranium, 2,000 in 1951, 1,000 in 1953, 1,600 in 1953. And to make sure that they would continue to have this access to uranium to continue to build bombs, they actually set up a processing plant supported by a NATO military base in Kamina in Katanga. So yeah, the U.S. has this direct role on the ground, making sure that these this uranium is preserved. Um, one other interesting note, and then we can move on, is that it is considered likely that this is how Israel obtained their uh, nuclear weapons program. So in 1968, Israel obtained yellow cake, which is processed uranium or uh France had stopped supplying them. France had previously been supplying uranium. And numerous sources believe that Israel managed to obtain 200 tons of yellow cake from Union Minier. The company collaborated with Mossad in shipping out the ore uh, to Genoa under a front company, which was then which then transferred the ore at night on the Mediterranean, which would then be sent to Israel to be used uh, in the Israeli nuclear weapons program. So, and then, yeah, they paid Union Minier 3.7 million through a friendly official at a petrochemical company to obtain access to this. So it just shows how Western imperialism utilized the resources at uh, the Shinkolobwe mine in Katanga, which of course used enslaved labor, just like every other mine in the Congo to obtain these resources. And that then are used for more violence against Palestinians, against Japanese people. Yeah, I just have one small thing that I wanted to add is just that, uh, again, in terms of our like theoretical framework of unequal exchange, we were generally, well, in the first episode we had about unequal exchange, we were talking about the sort of more purely economic aspects uh, in terms of preventing uh, inflation by securing these cheap inputs. And that's obviously um, a very important aspect, uh, probably in a sense, the most important aspect. But there's also this really important military strategic aspect uh, of uh, securing reliable access and monopolistic access over these really crucial uh, military resources. Like oil is, is a classic, uh, which was really important in World War II, Hitler you know, controlling the oil fields in the Caucasus and in Romania and so on and so on. Uh, and then kind of in, in, uh, to a certain extent uh, losing the war because of the lack of oil and so on and so on. Uh, but um, with uranium, it's also incredibly clear. And here there's this real need to have uh, a government that's very, very um, easily controllable 
um, and and also with, with with zero real sovereignty or autonomy, which allows uh, you know one you know, country, a group of countries, the, the West 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 country, the Western countries in this case, to uh, control these resources and extract them at will. Uh, because in a in a war situation, it's so important to uh, have total control of these resources, and for there to be no sort of limit on that. So in that case, it really it, it really restricts the sovereignty of the country, and then also in general, there's also the desire for it to be as cheap as possible uh, to maintain the war effort, to, for the war effort to be as cheap as possible, to have as or you know to use as much as materials and so on in the war as possible. Uh, which is not so economic as the economic unequal change we were talking about before, but I just thought it'd be really important to point out how important this aspect is. Um, yeah, definitely, and I I think you see that with in particular we're looking at this from both the macro level of the ownership and control of capital and mining in the debates around possession of the Union Minière and its assets uh, after independence, in particular trying to see whether it should be nationalized. But we can also zoom down on that with the unequal exchange framework, also emphasizing labor and the super exploitation of labor. So Chris, I wanted to ask for a little bit more information about exactly how the mining industry in the Congo, of course, many of us know today, the brutal super exploitation of labor that the mining industry uses in coal sand mining and our so-called artisanal mining. But can you talk a little bit about how this process has existed since the colonialism of the Congo under King Leopold? Yeah. Um, so as you brought up several times, mining in the Congo is essentially what is slave labor. Um, the wages, even though the wages that are paid most of the time, some of the time are so minimal that, you know, they can't come cover the people's essential needs of like food, medicine, um, and shelter. But oftentimes, which kind of gets papered over a lot, is that a lot of the times these don't function through wages. It just functions through, um, you know, direct violence, you know, murder, uh, assault, you know, now world famously, uh, rape. Um, and this is always kind of seen as something that is kind of like colonialism or imperialism went wrong. Not, you know, this is just an appendage of the system. This is just the way, uh, the way the system functions in order for us, you know, within the West to have what we need over here. There needs to be the super exploitation of someone else over there or else our conditions, you know, would probably look similar to what Marx was describing in, you know, France or what Anglo was describing in England at the time. Yeah, so um, Congo, you know, like many... Um, you know, colonized countries beforehand. They were predominantly agrarian countries. They were predominantly rural. You know, people prom primarily subsisted off of subsistence agriculture, meaning that, you know, there wasn't a large scale, there wasn't large scale industries, there wasn't large scale cities that were, uh, had people engaged in wage labor. This is often a point uh, that people within the West uh, often use to say that, you know, Belgian colonialism had actually even been progressive uh, or that, um, organization can't take place or social change can't take place within the Congo because, you know, you predominantly have a rural, almost ignorant population that, you know, they won't be able to comprehend these ideas. They won't be able to, you know, uh, fraternize with their fellow workers and go on strikes. Um, but you do have, you know, this, you know, this course of capitalism, this really violent course of capitalism taking place in the Congo in which you know, people that were primarily living also subs substance agriculture, you know, you have these monopoly capitalist Belgians that come in and they basically say, you know, you either work in these cities, you provide, you know, Belgian francs uh, taxes that you're not forced to pay because we are the local entity. If not, you know, we burn your house down, we take your family, you know, we take your wife, your children. And there's very famous photos of how that ended up for many Congolese people at the end. Um, so this kind of this kind of press ganging, you know, Congolese people, you know, into these mines, into these cities, kind of provide uh, a, a form of urbanization that kind of begins to kind of develop uh, some sort of uh, consciousness amongst the Congolese people. But from the very beginning, you know, whether that was in the rural areas or in the urban areas, there was always kind of like resistance uh, uh, to this and to this economic system. 
So we have this process of the Union Minier developing the resources um, de or developing its own access to the resources and industrialization to some extent, to a limited extent, um, which is definitely just uh, the technology and capital equipment necessary to produce mining and extraction. As we talked about last episode, we have the Katanga secession where Union Minier supports the Katanga secession since they basically run Katanga. They're like a private quasi governmental entity. They, their concessions, uh, we have a really great statistic from Justin Podor, uh, which said the Union Minier, uh, in the 1960s, uh, it controlled concessions totaling 7,700 square miles, which is nearly the area of New Jersey today in the in Katanga. So essentially, yeah, they are like running their own state um, with respect to how the size of the concessions that they have in the Congo. Uh, but as an entity, they initially support Katanga secession to get rid of Lumumba. But very quickly, they, as our Gary Emanuel talks about in his article, they switch their loyalties against Shambe because Shambe is on the side of the settlers and the settlers on the ground in in the Katanga region want an independent state, whereas the Societe Générale du Belgique wants to have control, like this imperialistic control of the resources of Katanga. So it's not in in the Union Minier's interest to have secession. They They prefer the Congo to become reunited again which at the end of this period we touched on last time with Gizenga as well, you do have a degree of reunification under Cyril Adola, who's the prime minister. This is in the 1963-1964. But very quickly, and this is what we want to dedicate a little bit of time in this episode touching on here, you have continued rebellion led primarily by Pierre Mulele, who is a Marxist slash Maoist inspired revolutionary in the Congo. You have what's called the Simba Rebellion, which begins in 1964. You have uh, the role in Eastern Congo of such figures as Laurent Kabila, who will become very prominent in the 1990s again. Um, and you also have the intervention of Cuba's armed forces led by uh, Che Guevara in this time period. So Chris, I wonder if you could touch a little bit on Mulele, a little bit about his background, how he came to be the leader of this rebellion against uh, the reunified Congo, primarily at this point led by Moïse Shambe and Joseph Desire Mobutu. Yeah, um, so Pierre Mulele, he was, he was working, or he was supposed to work as the Minister of Education for Patrice Lumumba. Um, but it, you know, around 1960, that's where Patrice Lumumba, you know, 1959, 1960, he really kind of succeeds in creating a national uh, political co uh, coalition to kind of unify around the issue of uh, independence. You know, some people are involved in uh, creating ethnic I identities to primarily push for, you know, their own independent states. You know, others are talking about um, the Belgians, you know, keeping the Belgians there, having the Belgian Congolese Congo community, just kind of forming the relationship. Um, but Patrice Lumumba really succeeds uh, in kind of unifying a national coalition. And one person that's particularly prominent in this is a man called Pierre Mulele. It is seen that around, you know, the 56, 57, he is kind of exposed to Marxist ideas. Um, and he was extremely sympathetic towards it. He wasn't really able to kind of develop his own uh, political party um, in, in that process, just because independence just happened so quickly. There was just so much to do because of it. Uh, when Patrice Lumumba is murdered, uh, Pierre Mulele, he actually called out a lot of, uh, you know, the EVOLUA class, the petit bourgeois class of, you know, Congolese that immediately turned to begin compromising with the Belgians. Uh, and even upon independence, when they they did uh, achieve independence, you know, some of the first things they were involved in was like raising their own salaries, you know, securing um, uh, administration posts for themselves, you know, family and relatives and whatnot. 
And Pierre Mulele was extremely indignant of this. You know, independence, the primary push for independence was to see a material benefit for the people and not just, you know, to remove a white face and replace it with a black face. Um, he kind of returns to his Marxist roots uh, to kind of analyze, you know, uh, what, what the state represents, whose interests is it representing. And, you know, according to his analysis, you know, it's still representing the interests of international capital. This is where he believes that, and many people believe actually that you actually have to have a second independence. So although he didn't like quite explicitly, you know, talk about what many people talk about the national bourgeois revolution and then like the socialist revolution or something to that effect, you can can kind of see him kind of like the movement, like arriving at his own analysis that, you know, these people aren't it. We need to, you know, form a more, I would say, a Congolese or working class or a class of the exploited party. Uh, Patrice Lumumba, I believe when he escaped from prison, he was just asking himself, why did all his, why was all his ministers collaborating? And he starts to flee towards Kisangani where the Simba rebellion was already uh, taking place or there, there was a kind of elements of it that, that were already taking place. So, yeah. Pierre Mulele, he then begins traveling around the world in search of international support, travels to the Soviet Union, travels to China, travels to Cuba, uh, very famously travels to Egypt. I believe um, from what you can see, yeah, from, from the evidence that you see that, that he got quite a, a lot of support from China. Um, I think he had about a year of training and education in China. Uh, I, I, it was his choice actually to not return with arms. Uh, he said that if the Congolese were actually going to need to, if the Congolese were actually going to, you know, uh, take state power, that they would have to do it primarily through uh, their own indigenous means. That they wouldn't be able to uh, rely upon, you know, aid coming all the way from China. Uh, Cuba also received them, uh, but th the extent of the relationship isn't really known because I think as you brought up Che Guevara, when he arrives in Eastern Congo, he's like kind of mentioning looking for Mulele and whatnot. And I think there's also uh, evidence that uh, Pierre Mulele had had conversation with Fidel Castro. So that was kind of a weird relationship that, you know, it's still uh, looking to be dissected. So Pierre Mulele, he starts off his rebellion actually in 1963 after about like two years of preparation. He starts off the rebellion in 1963, um, Kwilu, which is in a kind of like Southwest Congo. It's interesting that a rebellion here in this place and not say in another place like uh, Kinshasa where political power is kind of concentrated, Kisangani where, you know, it's a really important commercial city or, you know, not famously like Eastern Congo or like Lumbumbashi or, well, Katanga, there was a secession, but I don't know if it, you can call it like a general uh, uh, rebellion. And kind of like the reason why, like, kind of contrast uh, between the Kwilu region and kind of other regions in the Congo, particularly Kinshasa, is when it's kind of like this rural character uh, where it, it was absolute misery. It was absolute deprivation um, and kind of the worst and most maximal form of underdevelopment. Whereas, you know, people in Kinshasa, there's still an aspiration of being able to integrate into kind of a Western, more European uh, lifestyle, a uh, Western, more European si uh, system. They're kind of seeing the cities, you know, maybe they're not able to walk in certain neighborhoods, but they see the lights in there. Uh, you know, they see like well-dressed people in there. They... You know, so there, there's kind of something that's aspirational about these cities for them. Whereas people within, uh, like the Kwilu region, the rural Congo, you know, probably the images of people that have of Africa right now of like, you know, tattered clothing, no water, uh, no plumbing, none of that stuff. That's pretty much what like the Kwilu region uh, was looking like, you know, dying from diseases left and right. So although it was ethnically where Pierre Mulele was from, and I think it was kind of easier for him to organize there, the primary social basis for the rebellion kind of taking place there, they essentially set up their own Soviet within the Kwilu region, uh, taking state power, uh, setting up their own militia, uh, having their own prisons, uh, engaged in political education, uh, polit uh, uh, politically organizing uh, youth and women, and that actually sparks the intervention of 
uh, it was a Belgian-led intervention with the support of the United States and, uh, you know, Cuban fascists. Uh, this intervention isn't really well known about. I believe Malcolm X just mentions at one time that, you know, they're raping and killing Congolese women and children. And a lot of people always are curious, like, what do they mean by that? Or when, when he speaks about the United States doing that, and this is actually what he's talking about, uh, uh, their intervention within the Quilu region. Um, the repression is absolutely uh, brutal. Estimates say that around 100,000 people are killed, uh, which, you know, it's, it's really awful. You know, terrible, like, once again, terrible images start coming out uh, of the region. Uh, there's, you know, particularly with uh, American soldiers, there's actually, like, lynchings involved. So, lynching black, like, hanging black people from trees that they take images of that. You know, New York, uh, not New York, but um, American newspapers refuse to publish as this is a time during the United States where, like, racial strife is, like, really heightening. Uh, so the rebellion is significantly weakened, but the rebellion isn't de uh, defeated. Um, and the rebellion goes on for years, 1963 to 1968. Uh, during this period, uh, there is a lot of contrasting narratives, but it's seen that Pierre Mulele actually falls sick. Um, and he goes to receive medical treatment within Brazzaville, uh, Congo, Brazzaville. This is where Joseph Mobutu uh, is offered amnesty. Yeah, when Pierre Mulele actually accepted Mobutu's offer amnesty, he had traveled to the Congo, was then arrested by Mobutu, tortured, and then killed. Um, and he, Mobutu, the leader of his administration, and the was that it was kind of of like the great unifier that there was the mold of someone who was a traitor who was working against Congolese interest and Mobutu he was about he centralized the state he brought peace no violence one thing that I wanted to say about the Mulele and the uh, the rebellion in uh, in Kivu is that uh, yeah as you said like the amount of people that were killed uh, the Congolese that were killed by these uh, marauding bands of uh, neo-Nazi, uh, otherwise fascist uh, mercenaries from, you know, from from South Africa, from the U.S., uh, and and also, as I understand, plenty of actual like World War II uh, Nazis, not just neo-Nazis, but actual yeah. Nazis that, that fought on the German side, and they took and there are interviews you can see with them online where they're like really proud of what they did, and and plenty of the uh, leaders of these mercenary groups. They were employed by Belgium, uh, well, and also I guess I suppose by um, by Mobutu. They have like you know books that they wrote, and they're really proud of what they did and so on. Um, and uh, but yeah, what I just wanted to note is that it's very ironic that this enormous massacre of uh, Congolese people, where like uh, I've seen, yeah, different estimates, like hundred thousand, fifty thousand, uh, really huge amount of people. Um, that this is like ignored. And then one of, you know, I mean, the, the pretext for the whole intervention, the UN intervention and so on against Lumumba was this uh, so-called genocide. This is how the West described it, uh, committed by the army against the separatist region, which was actually at most several hundred people dead. Uh, obviously also like, uh, you know, a bad, bad event, but also it's worth noting that this atrocity was committed by Mobutu's army. This is before, this is while Lumumba was still in power. And uh, the, there was, you know, probably good reason to suspect that this was committed. Uh, I mean, obviously, also, Mobutu's military forces were always very disorganized and prone to various uh, atrocities against the civilian population and looting and so on. But there's also the high possibility it was committed as a sort of um, provocation to justify Western intervention. But anyway, it's just, yeah, it's definitely remarkable how the, uh, I mean, not remarkable classic tactic, but uh, Western fixation on the uh, so-called genocide by uh, Lumumba, Lumumba's army, uh, which killed a very small amount of people compared to the huge, huge amount killed in the counterinsurgency that followed. You know, that's what I wanted to say about Mulele. And, and one, one thing that's also maybe worth touching on is uh, why the insurgency, um, I mean, I guess why Mulele left, why, well, why the insurgency ended, because um, various sources, I know that uh, Del Castro, uh, sorry, Castro, but uh, Che Guevara, uh, in his time in the Congo, 
he he said that Mulele was the greatest uh, leader of the different insurgent groups that was actually really in contact with the people and so on. And that other insurgent groups were often kind of not really taking seriously, building ties with the uh, with the masses and so on. Um, but in any case, Mulele did uh, end the uh, the insurgency and eventually returned to Congo, where he was tortured and killed. And one could wonder, I mean, how much he expected something like that to happen, how much he really trusted Mobutu. Um, as I recall, the... Um, Talaja uh, Nzongolo book talks actually about Mulele's uh, reasoning, I suppose, for leaving, uh, ending the insurgency. And as I recall, it was to a large extent motivated by uh, the geographical problems, the isolation of this uh, single province, uh, although that doesn't really seem entirely compelling, but also just in general, the fact that that he was so really outnumbered by the mercenaries. And they were not just, well, really, they were quite a lot of mercenaries, but they were just very, very well armed, very well funded. Um, and he had essentially really kind of very little to no weaponry. I was wondering if Joseph or Chris wanted to weigh in about why the Malele uh, People's War uh, came to an end. There were some like great successes of Malele's uh, Rebellion. But there are also like some great weaknesses about, um, you know, I think you already brought up the geographic isolation, not just internationally, but even internationally, the Kwilu region. Most regions within the Congo were extremely rural. You know, the Congo, you know, it's essentially the size of half the United States and the type of independence with a population of just 20 million people. So the Congo, you know, today is a very, very sparse country, specifically, specifically the rural regions. Um, but at the time, it was just extremely, extremely sparse. So kind of spreading that across regions to, you know, from the West to the West regions was not something that Pierre Mulele was able to develop. Um, the rebellion was geographically, uh, uh, internationally uh, isolated. This was kind of something that Pierre Mulele uh, and had the fault that he believed that uh, international arms, especially at the beginning of the rebellion, uh, international aid uh, would have made the rebellion as it would have made people rely on themselves and more reliant upon producing uh, their own uh, goods that they needed for the rebellion, such as arms, such as medicine, as well as uh, foods. Um, that kind of proved to be false. Uh, there's really no excuse about it because most, I guess, most uh, revolutions, most rebellions across the world were heavily, heavily not re reliant, to, so to say, but they received heavy, heavy uh, international aid, um, not even just in the form of medicines and food, but also in the form of international support and really publicizing what was going on in these countries because that was of a strong way the West op operated was just a media blackout, ignore what's going on in these countries, or two, uh, obscure. So, you know, call the people terrorists, you know, start referring to, you know, use women's rights as kind of like a cudgel and not actually looking at the general conditions which produces, you know, uh, oppression against women. Uh, so World humanitarianism, uh, so on and so forth. You know, having the, inter the United Nations inter quote unquote peacekeepers, but often heavily favoring uh, forces in the area uh, as well. Che Guevara, uh, and just to kind of touch upon once again, speak on the general isolation, is that Che Guevara actually entered the Congo through Tanzania. So Che Guevara was probably based in Eastern Congo. Uh, Pierre Mulele was all in Western Congo, so they're about you know 3,000 kilometers apart. Uh, so you know them kind of meeting up and kind of joining forces kind of became you know diff difficult by uh, uh, by the geography of the Congo as well. Uh, the difference between the rebellion and say the, the Mulele rebellion and but let's just throw this in there and like say like the Congo session I think as Peter brought up was that the uh, region had 
uh, a strong politiciz politicization of it. Uh, the people were expected to be politically conscious. Um, this was kind of like a, a Marxist, you know, Maoist influence that they had was that people were expected to politi be politically conscious and to take part in it themselves. Uh, you know, not only you know the men, but also women as well as children. It was supposed to mobilize everybody. Uh, in the other regions, it was more so what they would say was fighting for loot, particularly within the Simba Rebellion. Uh, they were just kind of upset with kind of their maneuvering within Kinshasa politics. They weren't able to uh, attain the administration position that they wanted. So now they're kind of involved in, you know, using our force uh, to, you know, uh, get those positions, which is like a dominant view in the Congo today. If people are, uh, whether that's a peaceful violent protest it's automatically seen as you know just all the decision and that's all they really want um and then with comparison to the katanga secession uh, people view it entirely as uh the mirroring the work of the belgian settlers uh, not some was indigenous indigenously congolese um so yeah i think that's that's a really interesting uh look at mulele uh insurgency and i, and I guess we can sort of say you know, I think often when you read uh, left-wing Marxist analysis of various, uh, which you can call failed revolutions and so on, there can sometimes be a tendency to, I mean, I think in the sense, I get this feeling to maybe overthink the extent to which there were some kind of, you know, internal contradictions that led to the failure. Uh, and that's definitely very useful. But also, there are also situations where there's just a real preponderance of force on one side. Um, and I think you can kind of see this with the Mulele rebellion in which they managed to achieve some really huge successes, but the geographic isolation um, and the uh, yeah preponderance of force on the um, uh, imperialist side kind of made them doomed. But I guess in this context, that's where the importance of the international solidarities really huge where if there'd been uh, you know neighboring countries and also in general the, the global the global community <laughs> so to speak had uh, taken more the side of uh, these uh, different insurgent forces against the illegitimate um, coup government really uh, then there could have been better chances and I mean that's um, something that did happen to an extent you know and there were there was you know the, the Soviet Union, made a, a quite a big deal of bringing this uh, the whole issue of, of Congo up at the uh, in the UN and so on especially around the time of Lumumba assassination but then and, and then also the other pan-africanist uh, pan-arabist nations and so on were and various third world uh, non-aligned movements and nations were bringing up this topic but uh, and there were also different things with uh, training of the rebels in Congo Brazzaville and also by Algeria that was a, quite a big thing of uh, setting up various training camps for the uh, the progressive rebels in Congo, but it was also it was just very difficult as well to geographically coordinate um, these different different regions where there weren't always friendly uh, bordering nations and and then the fact that you know South Africa you know in terms of national solidarity and bordering nations then there was South Africa really close by uh, which was able to uh, quite easily ship all the huge amounts of you know its people and mercenaries and so on and use that as a base so anyway it's a very difficult situation and i think it's it's not worth uh always trying to say that you know the revolutionaries themselves had some kind of wrong idea they everyone does to some extent but you also have to recognize the um the real i guess the material objective weakness that wasn't really the fault of the people involved anyway the so we have this the Simba Rebellion, Che Guevara, Pierre Molele. In the background of all of, all of this happening is the rivalry between Moi Shambe, who we went into depth on in the last episode as the leader of the Katanga Secession, and Joseph Desiree Mobutu, who later will be known as Mobutu Sesi Seko. So this rivalry, I would, I would say, is primarily, and we can discuss this, I think the three of us have a variety of, of opinions on this, um, Shambay as someone who allies himself primarily with 
Lunda ethnic interests, uh, whereas Mobutu represents a military figure, someone who's invested definitely in his own power. So some really interesting, I want to read a couple of quotes from Intelaja, and then we can discuss a little bit amongst ourselves. But one thing, for example, when he talks about Shambe, he talks about the fact that Shambe had laid the... It, so he has this quote where he says... Uh, at the Economic Roundtable Conference, for example, the Belgians laid the groundwork for transferring much of the state portfolio of Union Minier uh, in colonial companies back to Belgium through privatization, while leaving virtually all the public debt to the new state. And Shambay, who's prime minister in 1963, is largely okay with this, primarily because he is invested in the development of Katanga. So he's someone, I think, who represents himself as kind of a regionalist, uh, to some extent. There's also the fact that during the Katanga secession, Union Minier transferred 1.25 billion Belgian francs directly into Chambé's bank account, which was in advance on 1960 taxes, which should have been paid to Lumumba's government as, uh, as revenues or taxes that the Union Minier owed them. So Union Minier and Chambé have this quite close relationship where he's literally getting paid by the by the mining mining by the main mining company in Katanga directly into his bank account for his services but what's interesting as as Emmanuel talks about is that Shambay ultimately is not as we talked about a little bit he's not the man for the main job that comes after after the rebellions after Mulele is is executed by Mobutu, Shambay is seen as a regionalist, someone who doesn't have the main interests, I think, uh, of the imperialists at heart. He's mainly just interested in himself and in particular protecting the interests of the settlers uh, in the in their kind of collaboration. So what happens is that Mobutu schemes in order to take over uh, from, from uh, Shambay. And you have this very interesting incident where Basically, Mobutu uh, ends Shambay's regime in 1965 in the middle of all of this conflict, actually right at the very end of the Simba Rebellion, when Che Guevara is just about to leave the Congo. They've been fighting against Shambay primarily, but Mobutu uses and takes advantage of the chaos uh, that's occurring to overthrow Shambay, similar to how he overthrew Lumumba. Uh, as high commander of the National Congolese Army, he proclaimed a coup d'etat on November 24th, 1965. Shambé went into exile to live in Madrid. In 1967, he was accused of treason, and one of the charges against him was that he had acted to the economic, to the detriment of the independence of the Congo when he had signed the Belgio, the Belgo Congolese Agreement in 1965, uh, and since the Round Table, he basically. You, Mobutu used what Chambe had done in all of his collaborations with Union Minier, with the Belgian, with Belgian imperialists, and this 1965 agreement that was signed, which also helped uh, dump all of the debt onto the Congo, and and it would take on state debt. One of the things that that 1965 agreement did was set up a like a debt servicing fund, Belgo Congolais dem d'amortissement et de gestion, which was to service the the debt that the Congo took on under having nationalized, or not nationalized, but basically the the state debts that, that the Belgian state, the Belgian colonial state had taken from mining, the Congolese state took after independence. So it it dumped all of these debts. They didn't really get much in exchange. Of course, Shambay, as we noted, got these personal payments from uh, from the Union Minier, so he was happy with that. But Mobutu used this very successfully as an accusation against him. Um, Maybe I can just also just mention yeah. uh, quickly that uh, we were talking about the uh, uh, white mercenary forces that oh, yeah. killed around 100,000 people uh, in the in the... Where in the area, the, the Kivu area, is, of course, I understand, uh, where Malulu's insurgency operated. And I just made a mistake saying it was Mobutu paying them, because actually at this point it was Chambe that was actually paying for them, really, uh, which is worth emphasizing. And uh, and I guess just uh, maybe just an overview for listeners about the, the whole situation with uh, Katanga and Chambe and the settlers. 
is that it was because Katanga was as a region was so rich in um, in different various minerals that uh, a, a huge amount of settle of white settlers moved to this uh, part of Congo by the by the fifties and sixties, and which made which meant that it had the highest amount of settlers, uh, like I guess you know, per capita, the highest density, I suppose, of settlers in all of uh, Congo, along with being extremely economically important, like you mentioned, and, and so on, and then. Chambe's role here as well uh, is that as being a member of this kind of uh, royal family, he was also one of the the only millionaires, black black millionaires in Congo. Uh, so very very privileged person, uh, and uh, he felt uh, in a sense solidarity with the settlers because of the influx of uh, Baluba ethnicity uh, Congolese into Katanga. And we talked a bit about Baluba, uh, the Lua conflict in the previous episode. You know, Baluba and the Lua are actually like very similar. And it's very kind of like Sangolo talks about how it's very kind of invented by the colonial administration ethnic conflict. But basically, suffice to say that the Baluba were kind of a majority, uh, much more numerous ethnic group. Um, and they were quite oppressed. Uh, and they were forced to sort of look for other places to live uh, quite often. And, and they entered the Katanga area and then uh, for work and jobs and so on. And then uh, Chambe felt threatened by them to an extent as this member, this, as this kind of part of the uh, elite of the uh, colonial class in general, and educated in America as well, which is, which is the, by an American missionary school or something. But um and his family bailed him out for all of his failed business projects, which all like inevitably failed. Uh, but in any case, so that's how there was kind of this uh, one of the reasons for this uh, convergence of interest between the white settlers and Chambe, along with just Chambe wanting just opportunistic, looking for a way to have power, and the settlers were going to give him the sort of power as this kind of puppet uh, head of the. Um, um, breakaway republic or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and as that breakaway republic is shut down by Mobutu, who also, as we were, we were talking about a little bit before we started recording, uh, he represented himself as this centralizing figure who could mm. unite the Congo, unite what he would call Zaire. So he just a little interesting anecdote, which was that he went so far to, take out Chambe as an adversary that with the assistance of the CIA, he in June of 1967 had Chambe kidnapped while he was on a prearranged flight from Palma de Mallorca to Ibiza, uh, where he was going to have a meeting concerning a fictitious investment project. So Peter, just as you were mentioning, all he was involved in all these kind of like scam investments and businesses. Uh, he was kidnapped by the CIA and then later would die in an Algerian prison two years later for his crimes. So Mobutu, I think this rep this represents really his kind of complicated political legacy, right? Um, in Zongo, uh, in Talaja, he, he talks a lot about how Mobutu is a very confusing figure politically that he has. Ultimately, he is he's petty bourgeois. He's a collaborator, a uh, comprador. But he does this under the veneer of Zairianization, uh, what he called economic nationalism. He even once labeled himself an anti-capitalist revolutionary, which I think shows this kind of confusing ideology. And one way to segue into that, just to continue with our analysis of Union Minier, I just want to update and then read a quote from Intelaja, and then we can discuss amongst ourselves a little bit. But this trajectory of what happens with Union Minier in 1966, when Mobutu is in power, the Congolese government announces its decision to expropriate Union Minier and transfer its assets to a new company. It makes the law that all foreign companies have to have a head office in in the Congo, which Union Minier did not. And so Union Minier and the Zairean government under Mobutu go through this long extended process uh, of expropriation, nationalization, which the Union Minier resists heavily. Uh, so instead, Mobutu uses the assets that have been seized and establishes Gecko Min, which is uh, the state-owned company. 
And he initially has a 60% ownership by the Zairean state, but in the end, that becomes 100% because he can't find private uh, partnerships necessarily who will back this until later on. One of the one of the claims that he makes was the fact that Union Minier owed the Congolese state 7.5 billion francs that it hadn't paid because the Congolese state had an 18% participation in the shares, but the Belgian but Union Minier refused to pay. Um, they basically argued that by nationalizing their assets, the Zairean state had had repudiated their commitments, um, which they had previously signed under Shambay. So they were trying to hold uh, the post Shambay government accountable for the bad deals that Shambay had had entered them into. Eventually, in the end, they they reached sort of an agreement whereby they would phase out Belgian management in Congolese mines, and and Gekomin would be a state. A, primarily a state-owned enterprise. Uh, so, for example, the last Belgian in the management of mines in the Congo retired on June 30th, 1974. And after this, there were no longer any Belgians in the administration um, of the, the mines themselves. And then I just want to read this and we can discuss a little bit more about like what exactly was Mobutu's ideology behind this nationalization. Which in the end, I should note also uh, that the nationalization ultimately ended in privatization anyways, primarily by a shift from Belgian to American hegemony, whereby as Belgian capital is removed, and Intelaja also talks about the fact that the U.S. is the main force advising Mobutu at this time. The CIA is very present. He receives a lot of military aid from the U.S. as a strong ally against uh, communism in Africa and supporter of apartheid and supporter of uh, UNITA and Angola. So on page 148, Intelaja talks about how Zairianization, uh, he talks about how Rather than weakening the links of economic dependence, the nationalization of the copper industry strengthened them. The Mobutu regime settled for compromises and face-saving agreements that his propaganda machine did not hesitate to sell to the people as real victories in the war for, quote, economic independence. The fundamental reality that this episode demonstrates, and the one that the 1973 Zairianization of foreign-owned commercial and agricultural enterprises confirmed, was... Uh, is that the basic goal of the Mobutu regime was to reinforce its bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis foreign capital in order to provide the new ruling class with a strong economic base made up of the petty bourgeois leaders of the independent struggle and the newer re recruits among university graduates, military officers, and rich merchants. This class was the main beneficiary of Mobutu's dictatorship. And he also mentions one really interesting fact, which is that the price of copper was relatively high early on while Mobutu was doing his Zairianization where he changed Congolese francs to the currency of the Zaire and nationalized the copper industry. The copper price was quite high, primarily due to the Vietnam War. And it was needed, as we were mentioning earlier, it was needed for all these electrical circuits and machines uh, to be used by the United States for the Vietnam War. But once the war ended, the price of copper collapsed. And so the gecko mean industry that Mobutu ran in the Congo was very ineffective. It was very unprofitable and operated at a loss, primarily because the copper prices were so low. So maybe we can discuss Chris, if, if you want to start first, and then Peter, we can discuss a little bit about what exactly was Mobutu's ideology, uh, what did the nationalization of the mines within the Congo do, did it ultimately help in moving out of the dependency that the Congo had on the West for, for capital, or in the end, did it just reinforce that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, like in this kind of like uh, question, there's kind of a lot that I just delves back into the Congolese history, you know, developing capacity um, during the process of social change, um, kind of cutting off dependency from the West uh, and so on and so forth. I think when people talk about Mobutu's ideology, I think it's better to talk about what the United States would allow him to do, the capacity that they would allow him to function under. 
Um, so clearly the United States didn't see nationalization uh, or as they kind of portrayed as nationalization, but as you said, immediately afterwards, foreign capital, foreign finance, and uh, especially foreign experts had to be brought back in again uh, to kind of run these industries because Mobutu was so incapable. And that's kind of, that, that, that's kind of the history of his administration with uh, the Mulele rebellion, they can't put it down. So they have to bring in mercenaries uh, with the run of the state. They, they aren't capable of doing it. So they have to, you know, bring in uh, foreign advisors to do it, you know, which who completely administrate the state in their own interest. Uh, I, I don't know if you can say that Mobutu has a uh, ideology like himself. Uh, that Mobutu himself doesn't necessarily, I think he's just, I view him generally as just an opportunist. Hmm. But what I see Mobutu is, is that if you speak about, if you talk to a lot of people, um, that are even supporters of Mobutu, it's just, you know, using kind of cultural chauvinism, using national chauvinism to kind of crush uh, movements of exploited and oppressed people, um, to maintain, you know, economic hierarchies, whether that's domestic or internationally. Uh, I think that's kind of the function that the people that enabled Mobutu allowed him to kind of function at. His, his only role that they really about was, was he able to maintain an international and even a, well, really an international economic hierarchy i think Mobutu, you know kind of people that are supporters of him and his administration um to kind of assuage uh their self-esteem is more is he able to uh, keep a domestic hierarchy um you know between the people in the cities and the, the villageois the villagers um you know kind of you know and so, uh people like that so that's why how, how i describe the ideology yeah, I think it's it's interesting. I mean, uh, one thing that uh, Nzongola Taraja talks about in his book as well is he he kind of has a critique of Lumumba as well as being uh, as, as beholden to this um, petty bourgeois evolue, uh mindset, which he compares to like the he he calls it like the Nkrumah uh, sort of perspective, referring to the other the famous uh, post-colonial African. Uh, socialist leader, which focused more on, I mean, this is what Zangolo Talaja says, focused more on political independence rather than uh, economic independence. And Zangolo Talaja brings up the fact that uh, Lumumba didn't attend the economic roundtable in 1960, uh, but that Shambe did. Um, obviously, Lumumba's views changed as well um, during his life, and it, not, not just in regards to economic policy, it's also possible to note the fact that, uh, you know, before 1960, he was quite a much more moderate uh, nationalist politically, and he had sort of more positive things to say about Belgium, like many, uh, I guess, of the evaluators at the time, but his position quite radicalized um, in the context as well of mass uprisings against the Belgian uh, colonists that took place in the late 1950s. So anyway, Lumumba's positions changed throughout his life, and it's not, uh, yeah. But um, in terms of uh, the political ideology, I think it's interesting as well. There's a really, really interesting um, uh, sort of Marxist-Leninist uh, with also lots of Maoist influences uh, called Ab Abdul Rahman uh, Babu, and uh, he was from... Uh, uh, from, as I recall, from from Tanzania, uh, or yeah. just yeah, 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 Tanzania, and he wrote really interesting, interesting books. Uh, one of which called uh, African Socialism or Socialism in Africa, something kind of like that. Uh, and he really critiqued the uh, lots of these quite famous, I suppose, uh, post-colonial um, self-proclaimed self socialist leaders. He wasn't talking about Mobutu, obviously. He was talking about uh, Nkrumah, and he was talking about, uh, in particular, I mean, there was the, uh, I mean, the, the leader of uh, Tanzania, which I forgot his name. You guys remind me. Uh, sort of left wing. Nyerere. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, for whom uh, Babu worked uh, as a political, like one of the ministers, but then also Nyerere, imprisoned him at a certain point for, I can't remember what exactly, but uh, anyway, but he criticized them for um, these different leaders for focusing, kind of having this sort of, I guess, classically utopian socialist worldview that uh, focused 
more on the peasantry was kind of anti-industrial and against industrialization uh and it's in a certain sense like kind of anti-marxist uh as well and uh he criticized the sort of economic results of this and the uh tendency towards reaction as well but uh it's kind of interesting thinking about Mobutu as well in this context, in the sense that he, as I understand, he presented his regime as his regime, his government, uh, it's, it's a regime, you know, we call it that, uh, whatever that means, but uh, he represented it as representing these kind of, you know, original uh, Congolese values and, this, you know, the whole idea of Zairean values and the whole idea of uh, this emphasis on Zairianization, which definitely would have been very appealing for, I think, many people at that time, especially in the context of we're talking about the uh, the army mutiny, which uh, I think maybe we'll talk about it, but essentially there was a very important army mutiny uh, while Lumumba was still alive, which was uh, they were basically protesting against the, uh, well, first of all, the fact of very high, high salaries of the uh, upper office officer of the officers military officers but also the fact that military officers were overwhelmingly still belgian uh, white and there was this really famous instance where this top belgian officer painted on the bo- on this whiteboard uh like if he wrote on the whiteboard like before colonialism equals after colonialism in very kind of dramatic fashion kind of, and basically just to like piss off the uh, soldiers essentially which definitely pissed them off and uh, there was a, a big mutiny and so on um, but this was also in a sense directed against Lumumba, Lumumba didn't want to increase uh, the uh, the incomes and conduct this uh, Africanization of the uh, of the army at this point and it does seem like to an extent Mobutu uh, sort of I guess which would have been instrumentalized or took advantage of this um this kind of totally justified uh like nationalist feeling in Congo um and sort of did the things that Lumumba didn't do or didn't have the time to do and it, by so doing was able to sort of avoid uh being vilified as this kind of neocolonial puppet at least by some sections uh, of Congolese society that might have otherwise done so. And I think you can definitely, I think Chris, you were saying how his, his, uh, his regime really favored the, uh, kind of the urban population, uh, of Congo as well. And you can see how, you know, it was really favoring this kind of, what we're talking about, this Evaluate class, uh, that could get lots of good opportunities, uh, under Mobutu in terms of joining his various, you know, like cultural, different brigades that he had, not the different kind of, uh, there was lots of, there were lots of benefits for these different, you know, cultural workers and so on. Uh, you know, petty bourgeoisie, essentially, intellig- intelligentsia, uh, while the, the, um, you know, the rural majority was living very badly. Um, so in that sense, it's interesting. and, you know, I mean, obviously the petty bourgeoisie is also the class that's quite tends towards these kind of nationalistic, cultural nationalist, uh, political expressions, and in that sense, the Mobutu regime was quite quite appropriate for that. Um, but it is it is also interesting analyzing it in terms of these Cold War, this Cold War tendency for this, you know, uh, kind of anti-Marxist socialism that was against industrialization and was kind of seemingly ambiguous in the Third World in the in the Cold War, like not aligned in a certain sense. But in reality, it was kind of more really on the side of the West, um, which in a sense also is quite similar to what we most people talk about when they talk about fascism, I guess. It's kind of this third way, um, you know, not capitalism, not communism and so on. Anyway, it's interesting thinking about, I think, Mobutu in the context of all these different things. It's funny that you mention that because Mobutu's regime was actually called para-fascist by historian of of the congo because of his rhetoric where he would say things like neither his the logo or the slogan for the the only legal party which was called the movement for the revolution of course like you know using this revolutionary 
uh, imagery, but their slogan was neither left nor right nor even center. So they portray themselves as, as this kind of like outside of ideology. Um, of course, their ideology was named Mobutuism, uh, which was meant to represent like his his emphasis on a couple primary things like authenticity, uh, which was mainly through Africanization, renaming like renaming Elizabethville to Lubumbu. Lubumbashi, for example, uh, renaming all of the cities, changing the name of the currency. But what actually changed? I think we can conclude this episode by talking about how in all of this, unequal exchange remains the same. One thing I find very interesting, for example, is that in the conclusion of the agreements of negotiation with the Union Minier, Mobutu, for all his rhetoric on nationalization, expropriation, whatnot, uh, made a clause to agree that the salaries of foreign technicians that were assisting the Gekomin after expropriation, Belgian foreign technicians or generally Western foreign technicians assisting the mining would be pegged to the 130% of the cost of living index in Belgium. So the wages that they were acquiring were still tied directly to that imperial mode of living based on high consumption uh, in the West, as Emmanuel analyzes these high wages for uh, Western consumption, while, of course, Congolese workers, on the other hand, Mobutu banned and made all trade unions illegal except his centralized trade union that was operated by the movement for the, the People's Revolution that he co-opted and made his, his own party. And at the end of the day, uh, I think, Peter, I'm glad you brought up Babu, because I think it really demonstrates how trying to stake this alternative position in the end just led to Mobutu. Of course, he's not necessarily genuine either, but it, it it's always a way to mask the ultimate interest of achieving that economic independence for instead having the superficial, uh, you know, authenticity uh, of cultural nationalism. Because in the end, as copper prices are collapsing, by 1978, as early as 1978, Mobutu had to appeal to the British, the French, and the Americans for $1 billion in substantial assistance to Gekko Min. Uh, and in the end, in 1991, the World Bank would step in to provide funding. This is as, uh, as we'll talk about possibly in a, a coming episode soon. In the 1990s, as as Mobutu dies and is overthrown, um, everything is collapsing and the mining industry collapsed and is essentially privatized by the West. So in the end, nationalization didn't really matter because it just resulted in Western takeover anyways. And yeah, and I think I think that's just a note to conclude on one one last thing would just be to point out that today most of the mining in the congo i think 74.8 percent of mining in the katanga region for example is owned by glencore which is this swiss conglomerate uh, which is known for their their human rights abuses and violations of of labor laws and you and on the other hand union minier i think very interestingly has converted itself into umicor which is a which represents actually the other end of the value chain so to speak like they've moved they basically no longer have any assets in mining but have moved to primarily be in uh, recycling and refining of minerals and the creation of electric batteries um uh they create like the the EVs for electric vehicles, stuff like that. They're mainly have washed their hands of their history, their colonial history of mining and have put themselves on the other side of the value chain. So somebody else, some subcontractor like Glencore or some of the like Congolese assets or even especially nowadays Chinese mining companies can do the dirty work of mining and a company like Umicor, which is has this colonial inheritance can do the refining process and they actually award themselves uh i believe and call themselves like one of the world's one of the world's like cleanest most energy friendly green friendly uh companies um, while also being literally the like modern iteration of union minier which is one of the most villainous companies in history which is i think fitting and shows 
just how little has changed after all this the false expropriation and and how much work and struggle continues to be done to actually have accountability for the crimes of Union Minier. I just wanted to say one small thing is that it's really insane how Mobutu, who was kind of oversaw the murder of uh, Lumumba, still like, you know, named the city uh, Lumumba and sort of instrumentalized his legacy. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating. But, you yeah. know, just to emphasize that Mobutu was responsible, yeah. well, most responsible for killing Mobutu. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And they were friends. And I mean, the, that's the sad yeah. part, right? Is like they were yeah. allies initially. Yeah. Um, they met in the 1950s, and Mobutu mm. was his secretary of state, his personal mm. aide. Um, mm. Like, I, I think hopefully in the, in a future episode, I think we should just fully cover. Yeah, I, love, I think really cool, and I'm gonna yeah, try and read the Dewitt book about the assassination of yeah. Lumumba and stuff, and and I think it'd be really cool to try and do some kind of chronology sort of thing there. Um, but what about Chris? Was anything? Because I think Chris, you have to head off soon. Is there anything else you want to say at the end, end of the? Um, like closing up for the video for the podcast. No, there's nothing. Else. Um, probably for future episodes. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I think we'll eventually we'll get there into the 1997 invasion by, you know, led by Rwanda. Mm. But that that's kind of like, I guess, I think that's really interesting, particularly with like African politics and the world situation today. Yeah. Is that a lot of like, just kind of like Hungary history, a lot of it's obscured, confusing, made, rendered intelligible. So that's kind of something I'm looking forward to. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's what originally really interested me in, in all this history. But also, when you go back and reread the stuff, it's also just really interesting, everything else that happens. 